All right, chemistry, let's do the second part of our video lecture for this combined section of sections one and two. In today's video, I want you to be able to summarize the observed properties of cathode rays that led to the discovery of the electron. I want you to, do to uh, summarize the experiment carried out by Rutherford and his co-workers that led to the discovery of the nucleus, and then list the properties of protons, neutrons, and the electrons. Lastly, define atoms. So here we go. We're going to talk about subatomic particles. Last lecture, we uh, introduced the idea of the atom, the atomos. And it was believed, it was named atom because it was thought that there was nothing smaller than it. We now know that's not exactly true. There are such things that, uh, that are much smaller than atoms. We call those things subatomic particles. Now there are several of them, but we are uh, we in chemistry are only going to really focus on three of them: the proton, the neutron, and the electron. So when we say subatomic particles, we're just talking about those three. So experiments by several scientists in the mid 1800s led to the first change to Dalton's atomic theory. Scientists discovered that atoms can be broken into pieces after all. The smaller pieces that make up atoms are called subatomic particles. The three subatomic particles that are most important to chemistry, like we already said, are the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And that's actually the uh, order in which we're going to talk about them, the order in which th they were discovered. So electrons were uh, discovered using cathode ray tubes. <coughs> and the idea was not to find the electron, but instead to study electrical current. While he was doing this, a scientist named J.J. Thompson uh, pumped out most of the air of a out of a glass tube, created a vacuum in a glass tube. He applied a voltage to two metal plates, which are called electrodes, uh, which were placed on either end of that glass tube. One electrode, called the anode, was attached to the positive terminal of a voltage source, a.k.a. a battery, so it has a positive charge. The other electrode, called the cathode, at a negative charge because it was attached to the negative terminal of the voltage source, right? The negative end of the battery. Electrons, sorry, electrons were discovered using cathode tubes. That's what we're talking about. Uh, Thompson observed when he ran the voltage through this evacuated glass tube with a positive metal end and a uh, negative metal end, a glowing beam that came out of the cathode and struck the anode and the nearby glass walls of the tube uh, because this happened in a cathode uh, a cathode tube he called these cathode rays especially since they came out of the cathode end and, and moved towards the anode but they came out of the cathode the glass tube Thompson used as known as a cathode ray tube. If you've probably used one of these before, if you've used an old-timey computer or an old, or sorry, old-timey computer monitor or an old-timey TV called a CRT TV, um, that's what CRT stands for, cathode ray tube. One of the most important things that J.J. Thompson did was uh, tell us that the electron has a negative charge. So because the cathode ray came from that negatively charged cathode, Thompson reasoned that the negative ray was, sorry, the, the ray was negatively charged. Uh, Thompson confirmed this prediction by seeing how electric and magnetic fields attracted the cathode ray. Thompson also observed that when a small paddle wheel was placed in the path of the rays, the wheels would turn. This suggested that the cathode rays consisted of tiny particles that were hitting the paddles of the wheel. So these are two very important things that J.J. Thompson did. Uh, he identified uh, that the electron was negatively charged. Uh, he did that by first observing that it originated from the negative end, the negative terminal of the, of the cathode or the cathode ray tube. And then he applied electric and magnetic fields to the, the tube itself, meaning he put a positive charge on the top and a negative charge on the bottom. And what would happen is the ray would bend. It would bend away from the negative charge and bend towards the positive charge. And since opposites attract, he concluded that it was negatively charged. The paddle wheel is important because it caused Thompson to conclude that electrons or whatever these, this cathode ray was composed of 
It was made up of small particles, particles that had math or math mass, maybe not a lot of mass, but enough to turn a paddle wheel. Thomson's experiments show that a cathode ray consisted of particles that have mass and a negative charge. That's where we're at at the moment. He later called these, or we later called these uh, particles electrons. An electron is a subatomic particle that has a negative electric charge. Electrons are negatively charged, but atoms have no charge overall. Atoms contain some, char some positive charge because you have to balance out the negative charges of the electrons. So at this point, the electron is known and described. The proton is anticipated or predicted, okay, but not actually known. When the cathode and anode of a cathode ray tube are connected to a voltage source, electric current flows through the tube and can be seen as a cathode ray. The cathode ray is made up of electrons. When a positive electric field is placed next to the tube, the path of the electrons moves toward the field. Using the strength of the electric field and the amount of deflection, J.J. Thompson was able to calculate the ratio of the charge of electrons to the mass of electrons. Imagine a baseball player throwing a ball. Like the cathode ray, with no outside influences, the ball goes straight when the baseball player throws it. A strong wind, however, could blow the ball and make it go off course. An outside positive field attracts the electrons in the cathode tube and makes them go off course. If the baseball player threw a lightweight plastic ball instead of a regular baseball, the wind's effect would be even more evident. The mass of the ball is one of the factors that determines the path the ball will take. Similarly, if the wind were stronger and the baseball player used the original ball, the wind's effect would be more evident. The strength of the outside force is one of the factors that determines the path the ball will take. By observing the path of electrons in the cathode tube, Thompson was able to calculate the ratio of charge to mass of an electron. So what did Thompson conclude? Uh, Thompson proposed that the electrons of an atom were embedded in a positive, positively charged ball of matter. Uh, the reason he thought this is because he could see, or he could describe, he could identify the electrons. Now, because atoms are neutrally charged overall, there has to be just as much positive charge in the atom as there is negative charge, but he didn't know exactly what was causing the positive charge. His best idea is that those negatively charged electrons were stuck into this kind of positively charged matrix of goo or whatever, of something. And he called this model the plum pudding model, or we call it the plum pudding model. But the positive charge of an atom is not found in some, you know, diffuse positive matrix. It's actually found in the nucleus. And a man named Ernest, Ernst Rutherford is the one that is credited with discovering the nucleus. So Ernst Rutherford performed something called the gold foil experiment, which disproved the plum pudding model of the atom. Not to say that elec the electron part was incorrect, but that positive, that diffuse positive matrix part. So a beam, what he was doing, a beam of small positively charged particles called alpha particles uh, were directed at a thin gold foil. And I should say that Ernst Rutherford is actually a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he did a lot of work with uh, radioactivity. He knew uh, a, a lot about what an alpha particle was, uh, but did not know about the nucleus of an atom. And so he's kind of an expert on the alpha particle in that he knows the alpha particle is positively charged and he knows that it is pretty darn heavy. Okay, it's a fairly massive particle. <coughs> Rutherford's team decided to measure the angles at which the particles, these alpha particles, were deflected from their former straight line paths as they came out of the foil. Rutherford found that most of the alpha particles shot at the foil passed straight through the foil. Very few were deflected. But those few that were deflected were deflected at much, much larger of an angle than he anticipated and sometimes actually went completely backwards. Mm -hmm. 
And so here is a graphical representation of his experiment. We have this box right here that is shooting these alpha particles out. And he had a, scr a circular screen uh, to measure the angle of incidence of these different particles. Here's the gold foil. And so remember, these things are positively charged. And he's seeing what is happening as they bounce off the, this, uh, the atoms of this gold foil right here. Now, he expected most of the alpha particles to go straight through because again if there's this diffuse positive matrix uh, present in an atom this positively charged alpha particle is not going to change direction all that much but that's not what he saw he saw these very large angle de uh, deflections which are not what he anticipated Rutherford reasoned that each atom in the gold foil contained a small dense positively charged nucleus and again nucleus isn't a very specific term it's actually a real generic term surrounded by electrons. A small number of alpha particles would, uh, would bounce directly off of this small nucleus. Here we have them in red arrows. Most of the particles would pass straight through undis undisturbed. And so this is what he observed. Most of the alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil, but some of them were deflected at very large angles. Rutherford reasoned that only a very small, concentrated positive charge in a tiny space within the gold atom could possibly repel the fast-moving alpha particles enough to reverse the alpha particles' direction. Rutherford also hypothesized that the mass of this positive charge-containing region, which he called the nucleus, again, it's kind of a generic term, must be larger than the mass of the alpha particle. If you think about it, that makes sense because obviously if you throw a bowling ball at a sheet of paper, the bowling ball is not going to bounce off the sheet of paper. However, if you throw a tennis ball against a wall, yes, it will bounce off. So what this alpha, pa alpha particle was colliding with must be more massive than itself. Uh, Rutherford argued that the reason most of the alpha particles were undeflected was that most parts of the atom in the gold foil were actually empty space, which we now know to be the case. The nucleus is a dense central portion of an atom. The nucleus is made up of protons, and we now know it to be neutrons. Rutherford didn't know that, but protons. The nucleus has all of the positive charge and nearly all the mass. Okay, Nearly all the mass and all the positive charge, but only a very small fraction of the volume of an atom. Ernest Rutherford, with Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, discovered the nucleus of the atom using a beam of positively charged alpha particles. They bombarded a sheet of gold foil with a stream of alpha particles. Most of the particles passed straight through the foil. About one in 8,000 particles, however, were deflected, sometimes directly back at the source. Rutherford explained these results by hypothesizing that nearly all of the mass of an atom is concentrated in a very small volume called the nucleus. If the nucleus were small, it would be easy to miss. Alpha particles which miss the nucleus are deflected only slightly, if at all. Alpha particles which hit the nucleus are deflected severely. So protons are subatomic particles that have a positive charge and that, again, are found in the nucleus of an atom. When we compare them to neutrons, uh, we see that they essentially have the same mass. Now, not exactly. You can see this very, very small difference, but they're incredibly, incredibly close. And so for our purposes, we say that they have the same mass, but the charge is radically different. Okay, relative charge on a proton is plus one. There is no charge on a neutron. That's why it's actually called a neutron. And there are several different ways to write a proton or a neutron instead of just writing out the word. Um, and so you will see and hopefully use all of these notations throughout the course. Now, the number of protons in an atom is uh, very important because um, the number of protons of the nucleus is known as the atomic number, which identifies the element itself. It determines the identity of the element. Because protons and electrons have equal but opposite charges, a neutral atom must contain equal number of protons and electrons. Neutrons, however, are subatomic particles that have no charge, but they are also found in the nucleus.
So far in this section, we've focused on two aspects or locations within the atom, one being the electron cloud, in which you will find the negatively charged electrons, and the nucleus, in which you will find the positively charged protons, as well as a neutrally charged neutron. We're not going to focus too much on the neutron itself in this section. Uh, for example, we're not going to go over how it was discovered, but uh, what I do want to do is show you this model of the atom and indicate where the different portions of the atom are located according to this model. So let's start at the nucleus. The nucleus is a small, dense, positively charged center of the atom. It contains most of the atom's mass. Most of the atom's mass. Not its volume, but its mass. The nucleus is composed of protons, which are positively charged particles, as well as neutrons, which have no charge, or you can say that they're neutrally charged. Outside or surrounding the nucleus, we will find the electron cloud. We'll go over uh, this idea in more depth in a future section. But the electron cloud is an area or volume in which you may find an electron. Now we'll go on to find that electrons aren't going to move in these perfect circles that are outlined here in yellow. But for now, I want you to remember that an electron is a negatively charged particle found in electron clouds. The electron cloud is outside of the nucleus. The size of the electron cloud is the thing that determines the size of the atom. Because remember, the atom's nucleus contains most of its mass but a negligible amount of its volume, leaving the volume to be determined by the electron cloud. <coughs> now, Coulomb's law states that the closer two charges are, the greater the force between them. That means that the repulsive force between two protons, right, two positively charged entities, is large when the two protons are close together. So doesn't that create an issue when we have a nucleus, which is very dense, is composed of a whole bunch of positively charged protons shoved close together, okay? That's very, very true. Protons f do form stable nuclei despite the repulsive force between them. A strong attractive force between protons must overcome the repulsive force at, at these small distances. And this is known as the uh, strong nuclear force. This is, we just call it the nuclear force. Uh, and what it says is as you get these protons incredibly close together, uh, there is an attractive force that actually takes over. Okay? But it only operates at incredibly small distances. If you were to separate these two protons just past that distance at which the nuclear force operates, the electrostatic repulsive force would take over and they would shoot apart with incredible force. But because neutrons can also add attractive forces, some neutrons actually help stabilize a nucleus. And so because of that, all atoms that have more than one proton, meaning everything except the simplest form of hydrogen, also have protons, or sorry, neutrons. So what have we done so far in this combined section? We have explained the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. We have summarized the five essential points of Dalton's atomic theory. We have explained the relationship between Dalton's atomic theory and the law of conservation of mass, the law of definite proportions, and the law of multiple proportions. We have summarized the, obser uh, the observed properties of cathode rays that led to the discovery of the electron. We have summarized the experiment that uh, was carried out by Rutherford and his co-workers that led to the discovery of the nucleus. We have listed the properties of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and we have defined the atom. All right, chemistry, I will see you next period.